Hello. The first discussion assignment that we're going to have has to do with judicial review. Okay. Judicial review is a concept that judges are to be the ones that interpret the law. And there's a very famous case that actually is sort of interesting. So I want to touch base on that. It's called Marbury versus Madison and it has to do with Jefferson and Adams. Okay. We have um, Jefferson, who is a strong state government, emphasis on agriculture, strict interpretation of the Constitution, and rule by the people. He has a French alliance. And then we have John Adams and the Federalists. And they're more of a rule by the wealthy class. They, have a, they want the strong federal government, an emphasis on manufacturing, loose interpretations of the Constitution, and he has more of a British alliance. And what happens is that Jefferson defeats Adams. Um, probably you all know that, but in the election of 1800. So Adams doesn't want to give up quite so easily. So he passes a Judiciary Act of 1801. And basically what he says is, I'm going to create more courts, add some judges, and I want more control over the appointment of judges. And basically what he was going to do was frustrate the whole um, new regime. And so he said, I'm going to appoint 16 new circuit judges and 42 new justices of the peace. And the appointments were approved by the Senate, but they could not be um, valid until their commissions were delivered, meaning until they were actually signed off on. And three days before the Jefferson's inauguration, Adams stayed up all night signing these commissions for the um, what they call the midnight appointments. So he's getting all these ready because, again, these justices of the federal government are going to be on the courts for life. OK, you might see this in today's politics, how this works. But what happens then is we have a man by the name of John Marshall. Yes, these men all look like white old men. That's what they were, I guess. John um, Marshall was the Secretary of State under Adams. OK, this is our outgoing Federalist president. And he was going to he was responsible for signing the commissions. Just weeks before the commissions were signed, Adams actually appointed him to be U.S. Supreme Court justice. And his term would take effect when Jefferson took office. Now, this is all going to be very important in a moment, okay? So, we have William Marbury. William was one of the justices of peace that had been issued a commission, been signed off on. But it hadn't been actually delivered, delivered before Jefferson took office. So, Jefferson, when he took office, said to his secretary of state, James Adams, uh -uh, we're not doing this. Don't do it. So what did Marbury do? He filed a writ of mandamus with the Supreme Court saying, hey, I get to be justice. I should be justice. You need to give it to me. So he filed a lawsuit. OK, now what's interesting is his lawsuit then went to who? Marshall. Marshall, the one that signed on his commission, which is interesting. You would think Marshall would have said, hey, I need to accuse. But it went to Marshall, and Marshall now is, it's he is the S Supreme Court justice, okay? And the, that Supreme Court had to answer basically three questions when this came. Is one, is Marbury, does he have a right to his commission? And if he had, um, does he, is there a remedy? Does he get a remedy? And if there is, um, is the remedy for us to order that um, it be his commission be given? The first question was easy. It would was signed by the president, sealed by the secretary of state. So the uh, um, you can't just revoke this new executive or the, be revoked by um, Jefferson. So failure to deliver it violated um, Marbury's legal right to the office. And what he said it's about, did he have a remedy? Well, yes, because as a general and indisputable rule, if there's a legal right, 
then there has to be a legal remedy. So these questions are easy. But the next one then was problematic because they, they said, oh boy, now what do we do? We know he has a right, we know he's a remedy, but I have a dilemma, Marshall's dilemma, I call it. If he says, yep, we're going to be the ones to give you the remedy, you have to give him his commission. Basically, he's going to be ignored. They're not going to do it. And so the Supreme Court, which was a young Supreme Court, risked being powerless to enforce any decisions because he knew it didn't matter what the court said. It didn't have the clout it has today. And so its future legitimacy is going to be bad because Jefferson's just going to ignore what I say anyway. But the other problem was siding with Madison would seem like, well, wait a second. He is just um, giving in to, and Madison, the one being sued, is the Secretary of State of Jefferson because he's the one that didn't deliver the commission, so you sue him. But so siding with Jefferson and Madison would be like, okay, it looks like we caved to this political um, pressure. So Marshall really wanted to establish a nonpartisan court. So he's in this dilemma. And he decides to do what is known as one of the landmark brilliant decisions ever. And he says, the Supreme Court, we're sorry, we can't order the commission because the law is unconstitutional. So he found a way to say, okay, really, he has a right and he does, but we can't be the ones to do it. The thing is, is that Marbury should have went to lower courts first because you have to go to lower courts. And he brought his lawsuit to the Supreme Court instead of going through the lower courts because of this Judiciary Act of 1789. And what Marshall said is, wait a second, Article 3 of our Constitution tells us exactly which cases we have original jurisdiction. And what that means is where you don't file a petition that we decide whether to grant. There are certain cases that we have to take. And it says um, uh, ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, in, or in cases in which a state shall be a party. And this was none of those. So they shouldn't have gone right to us. They should have either went to a lower court or asked us to hear it, which would have been denied because they'd say go to the lower court. He said, listen, if the, if the founders wanted us wanted um, co Congress to give us original jurisdiction, they would have put that in those type of cases that it dealt with judges or whatever. They didn't. And therefore, the Constitution is what? The supreme law of the land. We don't have original jurisdiction. Should have never come to us. So guess what? It's unconstitutional. And we are not the ones to be able to order it. It's a brilliant, brilliant move. And it's what we call judicial review, what he did. He said, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is, what the constitution is. And the constitution is you have to only take certain cases or you can only take certain cases, okay? And it's our job to tell you that's what the constitution is. That's what the law is. And so that's called judicial review when the courts determine what the Constitution means, when the courts decide what legislative um, enacted law means. So this is not something that was really new to the courts because they had made decisions where they interpreted the law or the Constitution, but it wasn't really like big then. And its scope was really, really small. It was not even that controversial, but today judicial rule review is a lot more debatable. Our judges determining what they think the law or the constitution means. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how that goes. So first as a background, there are two amendments um, that say that we are owed due process of law. OK, and the Fifth Amendment said without due, pro no, we can't be deprived of 
life, liberty, or property without due process of law, okay? In 1868, when the 14th Amendment was passed, we talked about that. And one of the way things it set out to remedy was the discrimination by states of um, and, st and they're um, still holding on to slaves after the Civil War. Because their argument was that at that time, the Fifth Amendment applied to the federal government. And so we, as the states, don't have to worry about the rights of our citizens. And so in 1868, that was part of the 14th Amendment. They said, you also have to give due process of law. So the Fifth Amendment says, hey, this government, but the 14th Amendment says, yeah, 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 states, you need to give people their rights too, okay? So just a little background there, we have due process. But what is due process? Remember, we have procedural due process and we have substantive due process. Procedural due process is, hey, you have to give me certain procedures. I cannot, you know, I'm presumed innocent, right? I have to have notice if you're gonna take away my property, right? Substantive due process talks about um, our due process rights and what actual rights we have. And that's gonna be a lot in our Bill of Rights, right? But what is due process then if it's, a, what rights do I have? It's the rights that go beyond the Bill of Rights. It goes beyond that. So the Bill of Rights, our first 10 amendments say you have this right, right. But due process of law, substantive means we have fundamental rights. We have these certain rights that we just have. The courts have created this over time. We're gonna talk about that. Now, what I wanna note is our rights are not limitless, okay? Government can regulate. They can't take away from our rights, but they can regu regulate. And there's certain certain things, and you don't have to memorize or these know, or you know, even know verbatim what they are is depending on what we're talking about, what issue, the government has to prove that they're, for example, if it's something that has to do with race or sex, the strict scrutiny says the government has to prove there's a compelling state interest behind the policy, the regulation, because you can't take away the right, and it's narrowly tailored to achieve its result. And then if it's something, and the courts determine which categories are in there. If it's something not as important, all the government has to prove is that their regulations serve an important government objective and that it's substantially related to achieving it. And then if it's something that's not really even a, a right, the government just has to show, um, or the, the challenger of the regulation has to show, well, the government had no really legitimate interest in this law, and there's no reason for this law, so why do we have this law? And that rational basis isn't used as much. But there's this whole continuum of what the courts decide whether regulation is appropriate when they're dealing with our rights, okay? That is gonna become important when we talk about one of the cases, okay? So let's talk about this substantive due process clause, this substantive. Um, basically what it says is that neither federal nor state governments can restrict fundamental decisions that affect liberty or property rights without proving there's some kind of overwhelming national interest at stake. And now let's go back to our, our slide before. And what we were talking about is how much they have to prove before they can put in regulation, okay? Again, this might be fuzzy at first, but you're, it's all gonna start clicking, I promise. Um, Supreme Court precedent says just because a personal liberty or other interest isn't specifically mentioned in the Constitution, meaning it's not one of our rights, our first 10 amendments, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? So what are we talking about? These fundamental rights, okay? One of them has been in contraception. In 1965, the law banned contraceptives and in um the distribution of information in Connecticut retaining or relating to them. And basically what the Supreme Court said, hey, it's nowhere in our constitution that you can have contraception, but there's a 
in the Bill of Rights, we have this implication with this due process, the substance due process, that we are going to limit government intrusions. And one of those intrusions that we should limit is married couples from excess, um, assess, ex accessing contraception. Because this constitution has a zone of privacy and where the government cannot enter, right? And this, we'll, we'll see in a second, pave the road for, way, um, for Roe v. Wade, which we're gonna talk about. This is how, just think about how the law is evolving in accordance to the constitution, okay? So then basically in Eisenbach versus Baird, Another case, it said, well, not only should married people have this right, but equal protection under the law says unmarried people, okay? 1967, there was a case for, with marriage. And basically it was the, the court said, hey, wait a second, you this is a fundamental right of marriage and you cannot take that right away from someone. So you cannot ban people of different races from being married, okay? So this is all paving the word. And yeah, as you can see the timing, right? We evolve, we're starting to evolve here. So let's talk about Roe v. Wade. Um, what they said in that case was, several decisions of the court made it clear that freedom of personal choice and marriage of matters and family life is one of the liberties protected by the due process clause. And what are those decisions we're talking about? the previous court decisions I just talked about, right? That's precedent, right? So precedent has been set that we have personal choice in matters of marriage and family, right? And the right, um, the court has recognized the right of individual married or single to be from free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as decision, decision whether to bear a child or not. That's our contraception case, right? The right necessarily includes the right of a woman to decide whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. This is their new law, right? And what their reasoning is, is certainly the interests of a woman in giving of her physical and emotional self during pregnancy and the interests that will be affected throughout her life by birth and raising a child are of a greater, far greater degree of significance and personal intimacy than the right um, for a child to um, so something child to private school protected? I don't know. I think it's the right to be able to determine private school or to teach a foreign language. Those are other cases. And they're saying, we said in these cases that you have a right to protect your children from, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be forced to, to choose that they can only go to one school. And the other one is to teach a foreign language. If those are protected rights, well, surely this is protected, right? That's what Roe v. Wade said. So what was the decision? The decision, the holding, we call it, was the court today is correct in holding that the right asserted by Jane is embraced within the personal liberty protected by the due process clause of the 14th. So basically they're saying this is a protected right. So what does that mean? Laws cannot infringe on constitutional rights, right? So that means you cannot take that right away from me. Prior to viability is what they determined, okay? They could still regulate so long as, right, it was um, within one of the, was, it was to meet a compelling state interest. So your regulations have to be a, a compelling state interest is what they said. Okay, now we know Roe v. Wade's been overturned. But in between it being overturned, in betwixt, there was a case called Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And what they were hoping is that Roe v. Wade, and when I say they, um, the people who had um, put the new um, Supreme Court justice on, they thought they had enough to overturn. And basically, they refused to overturn it. They said the adjudication of substantive due process claims may require this court to exercise its reasoned judgment in determining the boundaries between the individual's liberty and the demands of organized society. The court's decisions have afforded constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, family relationships, child rearing, and education. 
and have recognized the right of the individual to be free from unwarranted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as a decision whether to bear or beget a child. Rose Central holding properly invoked the reasoning tradition of these precedents. So in 1992, they tried to challenge it. Now here's what happened. They chipped away a little on it, okay? Because what they did is they said, a person's gonna retain that right, but the state's compelling interest in protecting a life means that it can ban an abortion of a viable fetus under any circumstances, except when the health of the mother is at risk. Also laws restricting abortion should be evaluated under an undue burden standard. So they changed the standard from, hey, government, you have to prove that there's this compelling interest to, if you're gonna regulate it, to now, well, you just can't put an undue burden on regulation. So they basically just changed the law there, but they kept with Ray Wavy Road, okay? The court added a new standard. So it basically made it easier for regulations to be passed. But it said, hey, Roe v. Wade was decided correctly. Okay, this is 1992. Let's move on. We're not gonna hit the decision where Roe has been overturned yet because some cases have happened in between. We have had um, a Texas statute criminalizing intimate consensual sexual conduct found to be unconstitutional. In Lawrence v. Texas, the um, Supreme Court there said, liberty protects the person from unwarranted government intrusions into dwelling or other private places. In our tradition, the state is not om omnipresent in the home. And there are other spheres of our lives and existence outside the home where the state should not be a dominant presence. Freedom extends beyond spatial bounds. And then in Opperfeld, the Hodges, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment guarantees the right to marry as one of the fundamental liberties. And that analysis applies to same sex as it does opposites. And the quote that I can barely read now, but the gist of it was that marriage is a fundamental right. And because of that, and it's historically recognized, and it's the keystone of social order, it should apply to all. So these two cases you can see, it's nowhere in the Constitution that that's a right. Marriage isn't even a right in the Constitution, right? But once we said marriage was a fundamental right, it's a right for all. Just took a while for us to give it to everyone, I guess. But the thing is, None of this is in the Constitution, right? It's what these justices have determined to be in the Constitution. Why is that important? Fast forward now. Dobbs v. Jackson's Women Health Organization. They said in that case, there are only two types of substantive rights. Rights guaranteed by the First Amendment and rights that are deemed fundamental. And although the other court in Roe v. Wade said it's a fundamental right to have privacy, and although the Casey, Parenthood versus Casey, said they were right, this court said at the time the 14th Amendment was adopted, three quarters of the states had made abortion a crime. So until Roe v. Wade came up, there's no way this could be a liberty because liberty would not recognize it as a fundamental right in the nature, history, or traditions of the nation. Okay, let's think about that. At the time the 14th Amendment was adopted, it was a crime to interracially marry. It was a crime for couples of same sex to marry. Does that mean that this is not a liberty that would have been recognized? So they said, well, Roe Ro either ignored or misstated the history. So what we're going to do is we're going to say there is no right 
in the Constitution. We're going to overrule. But by overruling, what does that do? It doesn't take away that right, but it doesn't protect it. Okay, there, there's the difference. The new decision does not take away a woman's right, but it does not protect it from the states putting in legislation, right? Because they can put in legislation as long as what? It doesn't conflict with the federal law or constitution. And since we have no federal law saying we get to, you have a right, because there's no constitutional right, the states can regulate it. And that's what happened in Dobbs v. Jackson. And what did this do? There were, it was 50 years. And remember, we have Supreme Court cases that occurred in that time that said other things were fundamental rights. And what did it do to that precedent? It got rid of it. Now, the Constitution didn't change during that 50 years, but the justices did. Okay? So here is the discussion assignment. Does the power of judicial review give the Supreme Court too much power? How does the fact that the Supreme Court judges are appointed, not elected, influence your opinion on the power of judicial review? And does it matter that they're appointed for life? Is it possible for Supreme Court judges, judges to be unbiased in decision making? I'd love to hear both sides too, because I do think there's an argument for both sides. I mean, who else is going to do it, right? If we don't have somebody else interpret, how do we go about this? So let's look at the rubric. Your initial post is, here is the rubric for the scores, okay? And your initial comments are going to address all the parts of the assignment. That means I want you to address those questions and I really want you to incorporate some of what we talked about. You know, think about how the decision um, under Roe v. Wade has changed. And think about how judges shape what is going to be in our, in if you have a conservative, um, a bunch of conservatives on the panel or a bunch of liberals on the panel, what's going to happen to that? Then you will need to reply at least two replies to someone. Okay. And this gives you the criteria. You can't just say, oh, I agree with you. So and so start engaging in conversation. Okay. Now, remember, these cannot all be done in one day. So you're going to want to go ahead and put your initial post out now. Then the next time you do your classwork, get on and start replying then you're going to have a response and the response has to be this if someone has um replied to you you need to answer their you need to respond to them if they have not at least two people have not replied on your chain go to where someone else replied on another one and respond on theirs as well okay now active participation has to do with your timing okay if your postings are evenly distributed and it looks like okay every time that you go online to do your um classwork which is two to three times a week you're engaged in the discussion you're going to get all your points if you go ahead and you just throw everything out there in one day you are not going to be able to get many points okay so look through the rubric and actively engage because I'm very excited to hear what you guys think on this issue.